So well. first, um, I'll, I want to give you a sense of uh, what we're not going to do here. Pinball has a very interesting, twisted, crazy history that has some really surprising stuff in it. Uh, we're not going to cover that shit at all. Um, also, I know some of you are excited to play pinball. We are not playing any pinball. You cannot fly an airplane until you know what the controls in front of you are. And this, you will enjoy it so much more, trust me. Well, okay, so let me just get into how I got into this. I wanted to understand what was going on in pinball. I knew that there was something like deeper past this curtain that people knew a lot more about. Um, I set about trying to do it, and um, I immediately found that there is a very high barrier to entry to get past that point where it's just like, this is fun, and I'm banging the stuff a lot. Um, and I went online to try to be like, there's got to be like a 10 minute video, like let's get oriented and explain some of the basic concepts. And I was amazed how there's absolutely nothing. Like it's, there's tons of material for people who already know what's going on, and tons of beginner stuff that I ultimately think is not even that helpful because it presumes you know too much. Um, so what this is about is you're actually the first people in this curriculum I'm putting together to try to teach people how what's going on here because I don't think it really needs to be so hard. So pinball, part of why pinball is so hard is because it is, it has a lot of really stupid stuff in the way it's developed over time. It has all these real weird rules that it's inherited just because as it evolved technologically, they'd be like, let's innovate, and then that becomes a standard rule. But if you didn't follow it for 30 years, it makes no sense at all. Um, and in this way, uh, it's very much like language, I think. Language has lots of stupid rules that get built in and baked in, and that's just the way it is. And that's why it's really hard to just learn a language by hanging around with people who are talking it and watching them talk. Um, visually, it's quite boggling. There's all those lights and colors and everything going off. It all means something. And after practice and a lot of study and understanding, it's actually all talking to you, and it's very empowering to understand everything it's indicating. But uh, at a glance, it's just so boggling. Um, the manufacturers, I think, pinball didn't kill pinball. The manufacturers killed it with like terrible communication and marketing. It, it blows my mind that this day, the, there's only one major manufacturer left in America. You go to their website, and you can't get the rules for the games they're making now. Like, there's nowhere is there available just like a rule sheet and as I'll show you the rules can be really deep so there's just such a from a marketing perspective and a communication perspective it's like they don't have any money to pay us but my god could they use us is it to their advantage to sort of make you pay to to learn to keep it hidden not when there's such a wall to entry that people don't even whatever because I think the difference between like oh, I'm at a bar, I see a pinball machine, that's colorful, I'll put a dollar or two in it, whatever, and like when I go there, I'm like, I'm okay, Lord of the Rings, you're fucking mine today. <laughs> like, that, that'll be $20 into the machine. Um, and it is uh, a total boys club. The themes of the, the machines, the things that play out in them, it kind of is gross. Um, and the machines being made today, you know, 50% of them go into the co private collections of middle-aged men and it shows that like these are the themes for like a bunch of pinball tables made in the last few years like these are the interests of middle-aged white men and so we're work i mean that's changing slowly but also again if i feel like if we can educate more there is a women's pinball league in oakland that we'll talk about later so um this seems like an obvious question i think you're here because you're like it looks like fun um but there's actually i want to give you a sense of like why even bother to learn about pinball? Um, the stories are trump the score. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm not good at it. I don't want, you know, for me, the goal of a pin, playing pinball is never like, I want a billion points. I, I could care two wits about my score. Um, what uh, I'll endeavor to show you is that like pinball tables, modern ones, they tell deep stories, they have progress, they have end bosses, they have. Um, atmosphere that can make you laugh. Uh, it's more about understanding what's going on. Um, understanding means more than skill. Um, I found that as soon as I knew what was going on, even if I was still not shooting very well, I get lucky. I know why I got lucky, because it went where I hoped it would go. <laughs> like understanding what ha what's happening, I find makes it so much more engaging than actually being good at it. So the, the thought of like, oh, I suck at pinball, or you know, I, I don't think I can get good at it. I don't have, it, it's more of a game of strategy than it is a game of skill. 
at least the enjoyment of it. Um, I think learning it is tremendously fun in the same way that you might take a French class because like language is fun and at first you're like, oh, I can sort of understand a couple things. That's neat, that gives me a rush. And then you're like, oh, I'm talking, I'm talking. And even though it's like the simplest stuff, I find that like each table is like a dialect of a language almost and you can spend an hour or two studying the rules and it's like learning a whole nother, I took like, I sit down and study the rules for fun, which I hope at least one person in here will appreciate later. And the key thing that I think some people don't get is that you have a lot of agency in the game of pinball. You're making choices. Um, a lot of what I'll show you is how to like take control of the game so that it's not this crazy colorful flapping like nuts. Um, so a real quick bit about history. I know I said I wouldn't cover it, but that's helpful is there are three major eras of pinball as the technology evolved. The first was electromechanical. So the earliest pinball machines Obviously, this is before digital stuff, before digital displays, so they were a bunch of just like uh, switches triggered by electricity. They had mechanical gear wheels that kind of worked like a watch almost in the way they triggered stuff. The only sound they could make was a bunch of actual chimes hitting like a mini xylophone inside of it. Um, this went up until like the 70s or so. We're not gonna cover this at all. I, these are fun. This is what they have a lot of these at the Pinball Museum in Alameda. They're beautiful and fun, but gameplay-wise, not what we want to get into. Then in the 70s, digital tables started to come about. Uh, these were called solid state because it's a solid state is like the, basically a microchip or a simple state before a microchip, so just like circuit boards that can do basic logic. Uh, you can tell these at a glance because the displays are gonna have these kind of like uh, digital numbers. And so they could add sound here. They could definitely make more complex rules that were going on. Um, and they started to dabble with animations just using these things very much in the way like your LED watch might have done a little <laughs> spin dance or something. Um, and then dot matrix displays came along in the, the 90s and this is like what we call a modern machine. They basically replaced that display with a bunch of LEDs which allowed animation, complex stories, a lot more atmosphere. Uh, there's <coughs> one company now that's doing actual televisions in the machines but that's, I don't even think they're gonna stay there because I think what's old is new again and this sort of digital charm of this and GIFs and emoticons and whatever, I feel like there's, there, there's an advantage to this. Um, so let's cover sort of the basic geography of a pinball table a couple terms so that uh, I want to empower you to be able to read the rules of a pinball table. Even if no one can play after this, I'd love you to be able to look at the rules and be like, oh, I get what that means. So uh, this is uh, Attack from Mars. It's one of my favorite tables. I think this is a great example of like, it's visually totally freaking boggling, like what's going on here, There's what's decoration, what's an indication. So what I've done is trace the basic layout, let's get rid of all the stuff that's kind of a distraction, and let's pare it back even more so that you can understand like, okay, this is what's going on on this table. Um, down in the uh, four, lower field is what we call this, you have uh, the outlane, you have one on the other side too, so these are going to go down to the drain if the ball goes out there. This is the inlane, it's a better thing if it goes in there. A flipper, obviously, drain, uh, and these two key bumpers that are on most machines that will, um, here we go, that, you know, if the ball comes into these, it will forcefully push them out there. Um, a lot of gameplay is a tense thing of watching a ball come down at an angle along here and just hoping that it is not going to hit it hard enough to trigger that slingshot because uh, what you end up with is the slingshots are not your friends because they will end up kicking it back and forth and the next thing you know it could go down there. Um, looking at this part here I affectionately call the spaghetti because um, often it's very hard to perceive what's going on in there especially with but I've even though I've cleaned it up a bunch. So you have your left loop, a right loop on the other side. Uh, you have ramps. Obviously, I've removed the, the uh, upper wires to make it so they look like they go nowhere, but uh, this would be called the center loop. It's a loop because if the ball goes up here, it's gonna come down the uh, wire path that I've erased. Uh, this is called an orbit because it's possible for it to orbit the outside and come back down, not all the time. 
this whole area is these three things are the jet bumpers, which are that's the sort of like pop, 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 pop. Those were all over the place in older tables. In newer tables, they almost always are clustered in a three or four area that is like the the bumper insanity. And uh, these we'll just we'll call targets, any kind of like spot target on the field. Uh, you have a center target, which is just, you, there's often a main big thing to hit right in the center of tables. And this piece here is called a scoop, which is a, all of these here are holes in the table. The scoop is a special hole because it usually faces the table and you have a metal scoop in front of it and then the ball will go down in. And it sometimes is also called the kick out because once the ball goes in there, something will happen and then it will shoot it back out at the world. Um, and then let's put these guys back on. These things are called habit trails, which is, I think, a charming word that the only other use of for is like those gerbil mm -hmm. things, the tubes or whatever. So it's anything that kind of, kind of goes whatever. Um, and usually, what these serve to do, they can. They're often bent in all these shapes just to make visual fun. But what's worth noting is all they're doing is taking the ramps and giving you a little bonus in that if you go on the ramp, you're gonna get this serve nice and handily to you in the inlands. It's always gonna take it back to the inlands. All right, so basic flipper techniques. I just wanna give you a sense of how you can use these things to take control. Because most people, when they play, it's like this. Blah, 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 blah. With some practice and understanding, it can be much more like this. You like grab it, think back, grab it, think back. <laughs> okay, so. How many people know what cradling is? Because this is like off the divider. Okay, a couple of people have the sense of it. So cradling is if you're you're simply going to hold the ball in the flipper right there. Um, this is the difference between like pinball being utter chaos that you have no control over the timing of, and that you can literally sit there and hold the ball, and in a modern table, you hold that for five seconds, and the display will start to show you information like, oh, it's your current score. You like hold that for status. It's so built into the gameplay that the presumption that you're going to catch the ball there and you're going to hold it while you think about uh, what you're going to do. So a lot of your strategy and a lot of the way you're going about it is trying to get into a cradle so that you don't, you're taking control. Um, here, I want to draw for you a simple understanding of aiming. So let's say we, let's say we have our cradle and then we let it down. The ball is going to start to roll down the flipper. Um, this may seem obvious, but the, you know, the physics are such that if I flip very quickly when the ball's here, it's gonna go somewhere in this range. Uh, if I wait till it's halfway down the flipper, it's gonna go somewhere in this range. And if I wait till it's right at the tip, it's gonna go somewhere in this range. And this way I can aim where I want it to go. It's a, it's a matter of time and reflex. It gets trickier the farther it goes down because the ball is rolling faster. And so like the, the time window, if this is like one unit of time, the second unit of time, the third unit, you know, it starts to get like more. And, you know, obviously if it goes far off the end, you can have problems if you like hit over here. Um, and then that leads into the idea of a wild shot versus a controlled shot. Um, if the ball's coming straight at the flipper and you just pam hit it back, uh, that's wild, like that's, you're just kind of, you, you have to then calculate, it depends at what point in the flippers, like half an instant movement it hits it as to where it'll go. You'll get to that point, but whenever possible, I don't know, you're my lines. Whenever, oh, she's your side. Whenever possible, you would love the ball to either be coming from a cradle or coming down here because it means it's gonna be going along the flipper and you can make the choice, you know? And obviously a cradle better because it's gonna be nice and slow, but there's some instances, like if the ball's coming back on the habit trail, it's going to be going too fast for you to just catch it in the cradle, but at least you have this, you know, this uh, period along here where you can, so whenever possible, we're gonna try to get a controlled shot as opposed to a wild shot. Um, a post pass is a really easy technique that makes uh, another way you have choice is if, if, the, if I'm cradling the ball here, um, as we just covered, I can basically shoot, I have a much better aim for this area of the table, but let's say that what I want to hit is over here because you're going to understand why all the ramps are there and what they do and so you want to make that choice. What works on most tables, not all of them, is you just flick flick this flipper really quickly, and what happens is the ball will go up, hit this post, and then nice and easily 
sail over here, you can maybe lift this flipper to greet it, and then boom, you've just like caught it in the other one. And then you can post pass back over there. So not only can you sit and hold the ball, you can be like, I want it over there. And then you make the choice and it goes over the other side. Again, it doesn't work on every table. Uh, bounce pass is another really easy technique to get some control of the ball. Let's say it's coming in straight down into here. This is like magical when it works because it's so easy. You're like, how do I not think of that? You just don't do anything. And the ball will bounce off this flipper and then you can lift this one up and catch it. And it's like the hardest thing sometimes to stop yourself from doing something. But where this comes into play is there are lots of, the more you know a table, the more you know, okay, when I serve, the ball's gonna come from here. If I get it in that hole, it's gonna kick it back out of that hole. And you learn, oh, if it's coming out of that hole, I know where it's coming from, I know that it'll come down and a bounce pass will work perfectly, and then I can catch it there. Uh, the other thing I might know is that if the ball goes up and around and out the orbit here, that if I hold this flipper up, I may know that it's going to hit that and it's going to be just the right speed for it to go up and fall back in and at least I get a controlled shot there. Um, nudging, so how many people know this, that you're supposed to hit the table, that like using your body to whack the table from side to side. Tilting is to stop you from doing it too much, but it's very much intended and part of play that you'll do it and in the video game versions you use the joystick or you use the touch, touch screen to actually shove the table. And there's two main instances where this is useful. Um, one being, if the ball's coming almost straight down the center, you have this area where you're, you're helpless. And it's actually smaller than, uh, than, than this, because if you think that these flippers swing on this arc, the center point's actually right there. And it's often quarter of an inch, it's, or it's just barely a ball. Um, and so what we can do is if, if we see it coming down and I'm gonna judge, oh, it's a little bit more to this side, I put this flipper up and then as the ball's coming down, I'll use another color to get clear, as the ball's coming down, if I whack the table to the side here, then I'll nudge the tip of this flipper just enough so that if this flipper's down, it will refract just enough so I can catch it here and, and get it back up. So that's one type of nudging is just using that tip to hit it either way. Um, the other one being, if the ball's coming in here, obviously we don't want it to go down this side. If the ball is right there and we just whack the table straight up, we can often encourage the ball to go into this thing and then back out into play. And there's all sorts of crazier nudging that pros do, but I've seen them, I've seen guys who like, by jiggling the table, literally get the ball to walk back up the out lane, but like, <laughs> that's not gonna be you. Uh, <laughs> And to, to pull back out, this just gives us a good sense of, um, I wanted to be able to show you. So like, let's say we know that on a serve, the ball's gonna come out and it's gonna fall out here. So I might know right offhand that if I lift, lift up this flipper, I'll get a nice controlled shot there. Or I might know that I get a bounce pass and I can catch it there and how all this stuff leads to you. And the main point here being again is the, you have agency you have control, you can make choices, and you know, if you know what's going on. Um, this, I wanted to cover. How many people have been told don't flip both flippers at the same time? That's it? I feel like that's the, everybody's first tip is like, don't flip both flippers at the same time. Who flips both flippers at the same time? Okay. It's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, well, the, like, okay, it is a common, like, don't do it, I think, the reason people don't listen partially is because it's, uh, you're like, ah. Uh, but also, if you understand why it makes a lot more sense, is that uh, in just the sense that we said with the nudging, even if you don't nudge, the ball is almost always going to be closer to one flipper or the other. And if both of them are up, and it just barely catches the tip of this one, but this one's up, boom, the ball's going to go down the drain. If this one's down, then you have a chance for it to get tipped over. So there's... There's no instance where just making a wild choice of one or the other isn't going to be better off than, than both at the same time. Um, you, there's straight down the middle where you just screwed, right? Well, again, straight down the middle, the only way you're not screwed is if you have one flipper up and you nudge the table, we mm -hmm. can push the flat flipper out into that ball. So you're never completely screwed, but will you react in time? That's hard to say. So. Uh, this is a little demonstration I put together to like endeavor to give you a better sense of how pinball tables have a story, 
and also how that story progresses and what the fuck is going on. Um, again, this is a tech from Mars. This is one of my favorite tables. I think this is a good learner table. It's pretty simple. They made multiple versions of this one, right? It was remade later, yeah. Well, that's a separate table, though, actually. But again, so this is kind of boggling. I'm going to symbol it down, and I'm going to reskin Attack from Mars, which is all about an invasion from Martians and big O beams and lasers and kidnapping to a table I've created for you that's super exciting called Chores. <laughs> Let's all do our chores. <laughs> okay, so how what's going on on Chores? You have up here this. Left, the left loop is the wash dishes loop. The left ramp is the scrub the toilet ramp. The right ramp is clean your room. The right loop is sweep up the yard or sweep up the hall. The bumpers are beat the rugs. Bum, 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 bum. And the center uh, target is going to be take out the trash. And there's a big trash can on there that makes this one fun. Uh, and we also have. The center loop is for sibling support multi-ball mode, and the hole will be the random reward from the chore wheel. Um, so let's look at how we can accomplish filling in some of these chores and what'll happen. All right, come on, drawing. Can you get doc points if you're an only child? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? I am myself, so I'm like, uh... Oh, I see what this is about. Yeah, this is about everything that I was lacking as a child. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna draw a blind. So you see that there's these, this is so I can get oriented, these three lights. Um, in general, if a light is flashing, it's saying, come and get me. Um, um, if you make, so when we start out, ah, here we go. This light's gonna be flashing, and these, these guys are gonna be blind. Okay, so that one's saying, come and get the first ball in scrub the damn toilet. So let's say we shoot up. This is going to go through a habit trail, come back down. This guy's going to light up. So we got toilet one. Now this guy's going to be flashing. We get it up there again. We light the second light. Now this guy's going to be flashing. We get up there one more time. These three are lit, and we've completed scrubbing the toilet. That chore is done. So we go on to do that. For all of them. Now that sounds like this is, I know, a little overwhelming. You're like, wait a minute, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, That's like 12 shots that went where you wanted them to. Um, you're not necessarily going to fill all of these in, certainly for a while, but you'll get there. Uh, we go up to the jet bumpers, and uh, the way this area works is if the ball comes up here or up here, funnels down in here, and then just starts getting bamped around like crazy in here. Each bumper hit will be one rug beating, and I'm going to arbitrarily say you need to get 100 rug beatings to complete beating the rugs. So that's how a goal can be tied to the jet bumpers going crazy. Mostly I don't have much control, I just want to keep getting it up there. Uh, let's look at taking out the trash, the main target. Uh, these lights will be to indicate that there's trash to be taken out in all these rooms of the house. Uh, this one will be blinking because it's time to take out the kitchen garbage. Uh, this is a a target that's a gate that blocks us getting to the trash. We have to hit it three times to light these up, then this goes out of the way, and then we sink the ball in there, and then we dump the trash out from the kitchen and complete it, and then the next one will be the living room, and so on and so forth. You can see this can go on for a while. And this sibling multi-ball will start out with this flashing, which is uh, saying, let's try to start multi-ball. Uh, if we get into here once, it's going to go up this ramp and around, come back down. This will light up, which means lock is lit, which is a term that I think is said a lot, but now we understand. Okay, so lock is lit, meaning that like we can start locking balls, establish multi-ball. Notice that this this little guy moved out, this uh, gate has shifted, so it no longer will go up the ramp. A ball will go into this hole. We sink one in there, ball one is locked. We sink another one in there, ball two is locked. Third one goes in, ball three is locked, and we start <coughs> sibling support multi-ball. Now this, uh, what's really, I think, boggling for a lot of people and, uh, is to understand that like in multi-ball, 
everything else that we've talked about, like this ramp being a toilet, and this that's all off the table. Like everything is uh, multi-ball specific craziness. You're in a different mode. And in that way, um, other lights will start coming into use. These circles, which have nothing to do with what we were looking at before, now that we're in multi-ball, three balls drop out, we can, um, and each shot that we get up into any of these scores a jackpot, which is just tons of points, but also fun. And if you get all five, you get a super jackpot. And multi-ball will last until two balls are drained. You're back down to one ball. That mode ends and play continues from there. Uh, and then lastly, we've got the chores lights around the, I mean, it's, I think most of us have seen like the lights around on a table. Um, basically each time I hit one of these targets, it'll light up the, the letter C, the letter R, you know, and once I light all of them up, that, ooh, I can't see it, yep. That will light up the chores prize light here. So, and this will we'll cover, this is the, the scoop again, where the ball will go in and be kicked back out. And the way this functions is like, the lights show you what you can claim by sinking a ball in there. And uh, if you do sink a ball, if we get the chores prize, that'll be points because we just lit it by hitting those letters and we claim it by sinking a ball in there. If spin the wheel is also lit, which is lit at the beginning of each ball that we play, you'll get a random prize, whether it's toilet automatically completed or something random like that. If we fulfill the conditions to get an extra ball, we'll get an extra ball. Um, and then, so down on this end of the table, a couple things that, uh, let's cover what these lights are doing. Uh, ball comes down the habit trail, comes through here. Just for coming through here, this guy's gonna light up. Uh, and now you have a function that a lot of people don't realize you can control is if one light is lit up, if I hit the flippers, it'll actually change which light that is. So I can go left, I can go right, I can change what light that is. So if the ball comes back through here again, and I've moved this one so this one's lit, then I can get two lit, and then I can move those two around, and then I can get three lit. And if I get all four lit, then that's gonna relight the spin the wheel if I've already claimed it there. So it'll give me some sort of small advantage. Um, down here, almost most pinball tables have a light in the center. This is your extra ball. It means that if I drain and this thing is lit, I'm not gonna lose a ball, I'm going to get another one. And this light here is going to be in the first five seconds of play. If I drain right away, this is something they did to stop people getting really frustrated too easily. If I drain right away, this light will tell me, okay, you're in that five seconds going to get your ball back. Uh, oh, hey, there's some labels. And lastly, come on, almost all tables have a bunch of lights somewhere in this region that are tracking the goals for like the overall, the overall objective of chores is to go out and play. We want to finish all of our chores so we can go out and play, which is a crazy fun points mode. So if I complete those four core chores, I'll light that one. If I spell chores and claim it, I'll write that one. I'll beat one. And again, if I manage to do all these things, then I get play outside mode. Again, it's like multi-ball, all things are off. Every one of these ramps becomes one of these play things. And you know, then, then it's like Super Mario Brothers when you get the princess, and then it goes back to the beginning again. But you play through it. All right, so here, if you're going to learn about pinball, there's a bunch of these are these weird terms and rules that make no freaking sense that accumulate over time and are mostly held over from mechanical thing. Balls are not balls. I could, this fucked me up for, <laughs> for so long. So it says ball one. Okay, great, ball one. That makes sense. I'm like, this is the first ball I have. It's ball one. Uh, ball one drains. Great, I'm on ball two. Uh, now what's really weird is a ball in this sense is a period of time, not a physical ball. Mm -hmm. So I'm on ball two. If I earn an extra ball, I don't go back to ball one. I light this guy up. And then I drain that ball, and I'll get another ball, but I'm still on ball two. That makes sense? Vaguely. <laughs> you get more play time. Exactly. But it's, it's the sense of you will never be on ball four. 
it will never say like I'm serving you ball four. It's 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 serving you ball two again. You know this light will go off. I'll still be on ball two. If I say I miraculously managed to light the extra ball light again, I drain that ball. I'll still be on ball two because I get the rounds. the light goes out. Yeah, they're more like it should be more like round one, round two. It's more like that's good. It's like boxing. I'll use that. And then ball three might be the last one. But this would confuse me to no end because I was like, I got two extra balls. Shouldn't I be on ball five? The heck's going on? Um, there's a thing called a skill shot that every table will say, take your skill shot when you first put your money in. Uh, and now you'll know what that is. Some tables have a plunger where you pull it back. Most of the modern ones just have a button that triggers it up. The skill shot on chores will be that the ball will ricochet in here. And one of these will be flashing. And just like we could control with our flippers, which one was lit, all we have to do for the skill shot here is have the one that the ball's gonna go over be lit, boom, there's a bonus for that. Uh, another, we'll get skill shot ones. Uh, another type of skill shot that's pretty common uh, is this idea that if it's a pull plunger, that I'm trying to, the, di the digital display is saying one, two, or three, and I'm knowing, okay, so number two is the skill shot, so I have to, I'm trying to pull the plunger at the right intensity to have the ball shoot up and then land in the second cup instead of the third cup or the first cup. Um, so are you, I'm sorry to interrupt, so are you saying the skill shot is remembered and then when it says take your skill shot again, you have to do the same thing? It's, um, the skill shot is always, sorry, what I said. So the skill shot is always related to like, uh, shooting the, serving the ball when you first go into play so it's the first thing on every ball the skill shot you either make it or don't and then it's off it's just a, a something extra for the first shot um, combos a game will say like you got a combo and you're like what the heck did I do all that is is if you go in here this light these lights might light up for three seconds say and if you get in another one inside of while these lights are flashing you got a two combo do it again within five seconds you get a three combo so an object Jeff objective on a table might be get a five combo uh, sometimes a table will yell hurry up at you and I find that very stressful my first be advice is don't hurry up <laughs> unless you know the table very well and you know why it's yelling hurry up at you the most common reason a hurry up happens is just like again if we got our toilet we filled these three in um, on the third one, this may start flashing, and all that means is within five seconds, if we hit the center target, we get a hurry up award. Like it's just a bonus, it's almost always hit the center after you've completed something else. Video mode is basically a video game that happens on the digital display. So I've seen people trigger video mode and then wonder why there's no ball, curse at the thing, and then not see that they're not playing a game that's controlled with the flippers here. Uh, this one cracks me up because it's just a terrible video pinball and I'm like I'm playing pinball <laughs> It's better uh, this one you like punch a guy in the face left and right, which is pretty fun um, Bonus so after each ball Physical ball um, You'll also be given a bonus score. This is just a weird points and rules thing, but so they understand vaguely what's happening uh, the bonus you get from, in the case of our table, every time you hit the jet bumpers, you'll increase this arbitrary number. Um, if you roll over here, and this guy lights up, and again, by controlling the flippers, I can move this over here so that even if the ball goes here next time, each time I complete those two, I'll increase the, I'll confuse you, I'll increase the multiplier of that, bol that bonus number. The main reason I want you to understand this is at the end of every ball, there's all this display that goes on that for me for the longest time, it's like, it's figuring out my numbers, whatever. Um, but what it's doing is it's saying the bonus was at this value. You got these multipliers that multiply that by and then here's the total number of points. And once we understand that, you can start to be like, oh, that was actually a nice amount of points for this table, cool. Uh, and there's often fun animations involved. And for some insane reason, some tables have a extra ball and a special, which was just in the 60s, a way for the managers of pinball halls to choose like, I want the special prize to be, it could be an extra ball, it could be a free game. It basically is just like other non-specific prize. 
but it's almost always an extra ball that says you got a special. And lastly, at the end of a game when you've lost, this is completely boggling too for a lot of people, your score comes up and it will isolate the last two numbers of your score. I know, like, do you even believe me? Uh, it'll, it'll zoom in on those last two numbers, usually with a fun, goofy animation related to the theme. Then it will start cycling through two digit numbers. All pinball scores end in zero, by the way. Interesting little, it all, for no matter how big the numbers go. And then one of those randomly will highlight. And if the two match, you, you get a free game. Why? I don't even know, man. Like, it's the goofiest, like, in, in this ball, it happens to be like a disco ball drops, shows you the number, and it's a chance to win a free game. Is it a free game or is it always an extra ball? Uh, it's always a free game because it only happens when your game is over. It's like a last little, they're just trying to get you to stick around, and if you do get a free game, don't be scared because this is when most tables actually have a mechanical hammer that thwacks a piece of wood. So if you've been in a bar and you've heard a pinball machine go like, thwack, like it just makes this loud crack noise against wood. That is physical, and that's about to happen here when you win your free game. Um, okay, so that's a lot of stuff. Um, I'm going to have some printed materials so you can like work with it. Um, I want to give you a path to like actually play and actually put some of this stuff to use. Um, I cannot recommend it enough, a game called the Pinball Arcade, which actually takes real world tables and makes virtual versions of them. Um, all the best ones of all time. It's available for every Ding Dong platform under the sun. Um, I'm going to presume most of you will get it on an iOS device. Um, what's great about that is that um, the pay structure is that the game is the, the base game is free. You can buy the tables one at a time for five bucks, which is what I recommend because then you can like pick one or two. You can buy them in packs that where they bundle together a bunch of great ones with a bunch of shitty ones. Um, but what is freaking fantastic and the best kept secret in learning pinball is that you can get this program for free. You can play each demo a demo version of each table that's limited by score really only lets you play for like two minutes. But what you do get for free inside of there is if I say, okay, I wanna play the trial of X table, uh, then I'm in, I'm in the trial version of Attack from Mars. If I hit the gear, up, come on, up here, I'm blind. And then there's this like nondescript thing that says instructions. I go in there, it gives me like a list of all the modes from the game, which make no fucking sense to me, so I'm just gonna hit play all. And then you get this, this is the only way in the universe that I found to like learn the rules of a table that's at all reasonable. It goes through each mode, each rule, it's redundant in that it like states everything every time. You have this like blowing arrow saying like, you go in here, this whatever. Um, the first time I read one of these, I knew none of the terminology that I just ran through with you, so it made no friggin' sense at all. Um, but hopefully this has been helpful to, the, to that end. But what's great about this is for free, you can be like, oh, that bar near me has this pinball table. I wanna learn how it works. You can go get the instructions for that for free. Uh, the downside is, is because they need to license these games, they will probably never get the Indiana Jones table. They do Kickstarters to, they, they raised 80 grand to get the license for Adam's Family and some of these like real but not too real, but there's some, the Simpsons table, I don't know if it'll ever come out. It would be lovely. Uh, I'll recommend some tables uh, that are, I think are good ones to learn on. You basically know how to play Mars Attacks. I basically chores is a, sl a ever so s simplified version of Mars Attacks. I would hope that if you started tooling around with Mars Attacks tonight, you'd be like, oh, I kind of see what's going on. And you'd have six months of study up on me. <laughs> uh, I played this like, I played it like mad in college too. And I knew there was some kind of rule going on, but like God help you just trying to figure it out from observation. Also what I love is all pinball machines like down here. Go look at these next time you see a pinball machine, it'll make you laugh. It's gonna be off the screen, it's gonna be here. There's gonna be a little card with a bunch of micro text on it that supposedly is the rules of the game. If you don't, I've, like, I've gone up to tables and been like, I know a shit ton about pinball, I know the terminology, I'm gonna read this thing and it's gonna make sense, and I'm just like, no. It makes <laughs> no freaking sense at all. Uh, also, Tales from Arabian Nights, Tales of the Arabian Nights is free with some versions of Pinball Arcade. 
the rule set is kind of complex, but atmosphere wise, sound wise, just like this is a freaking magical Arturo will speak. I know he's tooled around in, in, in Arabian Nights and just sound design wise. This is the first table that I played where I was like, I'm immersing myself in a, there's like atmospheric, uh, there's artistry going on here. Like this, this, this is all contributing to a, a different way to sort of experience a, a theme. Uh, Medieval Madness is very similar to Mars Attack. It's basically Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It's a funny table. It's a fun table. It's many people's favorites. Uh, Theater of Magic, I like very much. I be played it on a lot in college. Because, yeah, it has, um, it operates on a different structure than, Mar than Mars Attacks in that you're, um, instead of having the goals be like in these, like, by ramp, they're all in the center and you trigger them in different ways. Uh, I should maybe even try to explain that to you. Basically, Theater of Magic uses sort of a core different approach, but it's a good second table, I think. And Monster Bash is super fun because it's all the universal monsters, and you're trying to claim them. Each ramp is like, this is the Wolfman ramp, this is the Creature from the Black Lagoon ramp, this is the uh, uh, Frankenstein is the big bash in the middle, and you're trying to resurrect them all and then get their instruments so that they can form a band and perform the great monster bash. Um, here are some tables that I do not recommend, but are often cited as the best tables of all time, and they are not by coincidence, they're all by the same guy, and that is uh, Adam's Family, Twilight Zone, and Star Trek. These are super fun tables. This guy is really into the idea of a third, can I catch up with me? A third flipper on the side here, which I think is a mind fuck, particularly, I wouldn't want you getting distracted. All three of these have a third flipper somewhere. Um, they're great themes, they're, they're beautifully done. The Star Trek one is very unique in that they got every single member of the cast to read. You can totally tell, like, fit in the Terminator table, they're just like, I'll be back. It's like great, like you just sampled that. You can even like hear the truck in the background. They couldn't even get the whatever, but this one they just had such great cooperation. So these are tables that someone will tell you that these are their favorite tables and great tables, but I'd actually encourage it not to be the first one <laughs> that you like spend your time with. Um, and then you want to play pinball in real life. Some people feel that the virtual stuff. Uh, is a means only to play in real life. I actually prefer virtual better, and I think that the sort of magic of the design and the physicality of it and sort of the, the genius of this crazy game that's pinball that evolved from a physical game, uh, I think it holds up fantastically. Like in a, in, I, I, playing pinball on, Kate, on an iOS device, the core issue you have is that you're, you're touching the screen to trigger it, which to me is, uh, I don't get the tactile response. I need to play on Xbox or something where I have those two buttons. Um, also, with the touch screen to shake the table, you swipe in the center, but that's really a mind fuck because you're gonna move your hands, whereas like with Xbox and these controllers, you just touch the joystick and that will push the table in that direction. So anyway, I think it's totally valid if you like look at a pinball machine in real life, appreciate the artistry, and are like, I don't need to do that. Um, I will tell you right out, it will kick your ass. You will know a table backwards and forwards. It's on the virtual one. Every single one is different, depending on how well they're maintained, what the, where the sun is in the sky affecting the gravitational field. They're like, it just can be so uh, touchy. But it is super fun to learn a table, know what's going on. And even if I've gone to like pinball par parlors, watched people play and totally had so much more fun because I'm like, I'm not just watching something. That, I'm not just sitting next to a conversation in another language understanding nothing. I'm like, I don't understand what's going on. So how do you play pinball in real life? You actually are sitting in like the best place in the world for it. Um, there's a site called pinballmap.com uh, that will <laughs> tell you all the locations that have it. Um, you can touch one of these on the map, it will tell you how many tables are there, what tables, so you can search by table if you want to find a specific table. People will leave condition comments, they'll be like, Medieval Madness is here, but don't even bother, the left flipper is weak. But a lot of the, the owners and managers look at this site as it's the default way that like fans communicate with the owners to, your table's busted, you want to work on that. The, uh, there's an iOS and an Android version of this that works really great. You can. Uh, 
sometimes I'll just be bored and I'll be like, hey, where, let's find a table nearby. Uh, or I'll say, where do I, I want to find an attack from Mars? And, uh, oh, great, I can go to, or only show me venues that have five tables or more. And these are some great places around. Free Gold Watch was mentioned, which is in the city. It's a, actually a printing, a print shop that the owner had a bunch of machines, had some friends who had a bunch of machines, and they were like, why don't we use that weird corridor in the front of your pin, print shop that you have no use for, and we'll start putting machines in, and it's evolved to like, the best place to play modern games, and they're all owned by individuals, so they keep them up. Amazingly, the Pinball Museum is out in Alameda. It's a wonderful, it's $15 for all you can play. It's gorgeous. They have the most amazing collection in the states of the electromechanical machines, and a highlight is an electromechanical machine that someone completely rebuilt all the wood with plexiglass, so it's see-through. Everything is see-through. Everything that wasn't like, of the mechanics is turned into plexiglass, and it's kind of magical to, to see that. Um, and they have some pretty good uh, modern games. Playland Not By The Beach is kind of in the northeast bay, north of Oakland. It is the most, it is just a weird, it's one of the best kitsch. How many, anybody been, been there or heard of it? Yeah. It's like this, basically a guy who used to work at a thing that was like Coney Island on a beach somewhere, but closed in the 70s, like took a bunch of the rides and the parts, and like he bought a supermarket that went out of business, and he started to like put a museum to a playland that used to be at the beach, but you can't actually, but then he's got all these pinball machines, and the, the woman who played Catwoman, the woman who played Catwoman in the Batman 60s TV show, her fan club is in like a little office there, and like my yeah. friend like pops in, he's like, hey Bob, how, how are things with, what's her name? And he's like, oh, you know, well. Yeah, he's like, well, we're dealing with it. It's, just, it's an insane place. Uh, there's a pizza place in Oakland that has 10, and I'll just give a shout out to uh, Scarlet City Roasters is uh, the home of the, the female, the Women's Pinball League, the woman who owns that has like five machines that she keeps in there. She's really rad, uh, and I think a great, like I said, influence for inclusion in pinball, which I think mm -hmm. uh, it needs, for it to survive, it needs this to not be a, a one hour class that I think you're uh, all very lucky that you knew. Because I feel like if you don't know someone to usher you in, it's very difficult mm -hmm. <laughs> to get, there's nowhere where this information is collected in one like organized place, so.